for us, this is a, a unique moment because it signals our intention to really try to claim our destiny. We have an opportunity that, however, must be premised on getting not to know about each other, but to know each other. And there's a big difference. Knowing about each other means that we are likely to continue our habits to trade north. Knowing each other means that we are likely to take down the walls and to begin to understand the values and the challenges that confront each of us, and by extension, to see the entrepreneurial opportunities that may be av available to build prosperity among our people. And it can't just simply be about providing jobs. It has to be also about economic enfranchisement, creating a basis for ownership among our people, because that is the only way it is going to be sustainable. I listened here this afternoon, and my brother, Andrew Holness, is here as well from Jamaica. And he will tell you that for us in the region, we have a slightly different problem, because we have a Caribbean community that was established in 1973 that settled on a single market and single economy as an objective in 1989, but that has been constrained not as a result of the ability of governments to set the legal constructs, but effectively because we've not been able to produce enough, quick enough, in a way that allows growth to come um, more seamlessly to us. And when you start to examine the reasons, what is it what is the oxygen that's needed? You need people, you need access to finance, you need access to training. But the fundamental issue of access to people, and, and those from the Caribbean are probably tired hearing me say so, but for you here in Africa, I need to repeat it. In Suriname, we have a country with 580,000 people that is the size of the Netherlands that has 17 million people. In Guyana, which is the size of England, Scotland, and Wales, we have a country that has 800,000 people, but with a population um, that, that is nowhere near England, Scotland, and Wales of 66 million people. In Belize, it is 400,000 roughly, and it's the size of Israel at 8 million. So, and Barbados and Jamaica are a little better off in terms of the numbers, but when you compare us to a Singapore or to others in the developed world, our population numbers are still down. And part and part of the, parcel of the difficulty is that we have to find ways to manage migration more effectively in order to be able to create the dividend that you want to benefit from here as a result of the increases in your numbers of young people. Now, why is it important? Because whenever we leave here, we leave and we're going north. We're not going west. And we in the Caribbean are not coming east. And, and it is a nonsense because if I told those of you who were interested in banking and finance that we have a serious problem in the region with correspondent banking and de-risking, and the fact that ordinary members of our society are finding it difficult to even just open a bank account, then what has happened here in Kenya with the equity bank may well now be a model to happen in CARICOM because you have been able to use the virtue of trust to broaden the base of participation and access to finance in this country in a way that the Caribbean community is crying out for rather than being hostage to a few international banks that are not responding to our domestic needs and development challenges, but are responding to one-size-fits-all prescriptions that are being imposed upon it from the North Atlantic countries. <laughs> if I told you that the Prime Minister of Jamaica and myself are looking for investment in tourism and for people to be able to participate in the ownership of hotels, even if you don't have the brands, then you may more willingly look at opportunities in the Caribbean community than you have hitherto done. If I tell you that we have an international business platform that acts as a hub for you to be able to engage in and with the rest of the world and that it is anchored by double taxation agreements and bilateral investment treaties that protect your investment, you may wonder why haven't you been before? So that these things are critical 
if we are going to move the pace and depth of business opportunities within the South among Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. Regrettably, we have made this a government project only. And I say so, conscious that this is not for me about government or the private sector because I am a strong and firm believer that the state has to be an entrepreneur in our part of the world. Because unless the state opens up certain activities where the private sector is extremely risk averse, it will not happen. And unless the state takes on risk, particularly in research and development, it will not happen. So what are the other opportunities? We are in a climate crisis. You here in Kenya have felt it this week with your floods. And I offer our sympathy to those families who have been dislocated or who have lost members as a result of the floods. But we live it every day now. And we just finished less than a week ago our hurricane season. But what is the news? We are six and a half months away from the next hurricane season. That is now our continued reality. Our ancestors, our grandparents and great-grandparents did not have the luxury of getting ready. They had to be ready and be resilient. As a result, there are opportunities in the blue economy, the green economy, changing how we build houses, changing how we respond to restructuring our economy and moving away from a heavily driven fossil fuel um, economy to one that depends more on our natural attributes, be it the sun, be it the um, water, be it the wind. And why are we moving and looking north for investment when we ought to be looking at each other to better mobilize the domestic liquidity that we have in each other's country, invest in each other's country to diversify our investments so that we're not exposed only to our own peculiar challenges as nation states. We need, therefore, to see a level of transatlantic investment and trans-Pacific investment within the ACP to help us move from fossil fuel free economies to one where we have greater control and to allow for renewable energy as well as conversion of our transport sector. What is our reality? That we are being told that if we want to move to electric cars we have to wait in the line because the car manufacturers are going to satisfy the needs in Europe first and North America before they start to look at us. So where are the opportunities within Africa for the establishment of manufacturing plants that are looking to create and build the electric or hybrid cars that are needed to power the South? And who and why are we not working in a, com a cooperative manner, leveraging both capital, human, and financial from all three regions in order to build up whatever industries we are building, whether here, there, or in the Pacific. And I say so, for example, with tourism and the creative economy. The Caribbean has a mature relationship in managing tourism product. Why aren't Jamaican and Barbadian chains establishing in Africa in tourism? Why are we not equally having African, <laughs> the African agricultural diversification that Kenya has seen why is Kenya and other countries not leading with respect to that in the Caribbean, particularly in a country like Suriname and Guyana that have huge, and Belize, that have huge agricultural potential. And in the case of Suriname, is one of the top five freshwater sources in the entire world. So my friends, the opportunities are great, but we don't know each other. We know about each other. And the only people who can change that is ourselves. It is It's not an easy thing because human beings tend to stick to what they know. But we need to step outside of the comfort of our familiar and to recognize that we're actually more alike than we think because we come from the same values, the same people, the same everything. It's just that we've allowed the sea and others to separate us. I believe that a few people must lead the way because success is a habit. And if the gentleman in front of me who has taken on the challenge of creating 10,000 entrepreneurs in Africa, Tony. Tony, believes that Africa should not be the limit of his horizons, and if there are others like him who can do the same, then I think that you and Chris, who I met yesterday, 
can be the people who help create the bridges, the bridges to allow people to move and share experiences without the sharing of knowledge and information through television and social media and without the bridges for air and sea to move people and goods, this will be a continuous academic exercise. Thank you. I want to take my cue from my sister, the Prime Minister of Barbados. She made a very profound point that we know of each other, but we don't know each other. And I realized that when I took over the government of my country in 2016, I made it a point of duty to engage the African continent. Uh, and so far, I visited my brother, President Gaingob, and we have made very good links and we have had exchanges. I've made it a point of duty to visit South Africa. I've been to Morocco, and now I'm here in Kenya, having had the great privilege of hosting President Kenyatta in Jamaica, where he would have also had the opportunity to see Jamaica firsthand. You see, the important thing about developing the business relationship is also to have a people-to-people -people understanding. And for far too long, we have spoken in glowing terms about our relationship, but we haven't really utilized the value of that relationship to layer on top of that the business opportunities. So for me, a practical way of creating business is to utilize the people-to-people -people relationship. Now, for the Caribbean region and Jamaica in particular, we already have those strong fraternal ties expressed in music and culture. Reggae music is big in Kenya. I'm surprised to see that it is such a powerful cultural force. And uh, um, sports, we have uh, uh, great opportunities in sports and we share so much in sports. Now let's start to exchange business cards. And as I reach into my pocket, I am holding out the business card of Tony Emuelu. <laughs> so I know some business is going to be happening between Jamaica. <laughs> but that's the start of it. And there are so many great opportunities. Never let size be an obstacle for business. Uh, Jamaica is a small country, 2.7 million people, but you'd never know. Uh, the point is that on the world stage, we have an amplified voice and we speak loudly, but we're also very agile in business. Um, congratulations. President Kenyatta, you passed us in the race for being efficient and competitive. You are now at 50 and we are at 71. Well, don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna pass you. <laughs> we're gonna pass you. And uh, by the way, we're number six in the world in starting a new business. We have had, for the last three years, the number one performing stock market in the world. It's a small stock market. You may miss it if you're searching for the um, international markets. But it shows you the level and speed and intensity of business in Jamaica. So there's a great opportunity for investors here in Kenya and in the wider African continent to look to Jamaica for investment opportunities. And we welcome you, J Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean, Barbados. We have very stable democracies with very stable economic policies, particular fiscal policies. So this is a good environment for investors to consider to place resources. 
But more than that, we are now at a phase in our development where we are emphasizing infrastructure and energy, two critical um, planks of any country's development. In Jamaica, for example, we have been investing heavily in infrastructure. And it's always a puzzle to me because China has taken a specific interest. Um, the European countries have taken a specific interest, but we have not yet had an African country taking a specific interest in very profitable infrastructure investments in Jamaica. And I'm using this opportunity to invite African investors to come and participate in the development of the country. Very profound point was made by Tony about the need to have efficient energy. Jamaica faces the same problem where companies are seeking to migrate from the grid. That is an unnecessary cost, makes businesses less efficient than they could be otherwise with an efficient grid. But Jamaica has a balancing act. We have to fulfill our obligations to the climate. So as we seek to become energy efficient, we are also seeking to reduce our carbon footprint. So we have diversified in the last five or so years our energy mix, moving from heavy fuel oils into LNG, still not the cleanest, but still less carbon emitting. But we are now very close to having 30% of our electricity generation coming from renewables. Right now we are at about 17 to 18%, but we're positioning our grid such that we can incorporate more renewables without increasing the cost. The technology is improving. What we need to move a pace with the technology is the willingness for firms to make those investments in the new technology. So I, you know, I endorse what you have said, Tony, and I encourage it here for African leaders as well. Ensure that you have efficient electricity power generation, but also make sure that it is environmentally friendly. The other point I'd want to emphasize, because everything has been said already, and I know we, we're on, we have a time constraint. I mean, it's been said in one way, government should get out of the way. Regulation, regulators should say what you want and then step aside. It is absolutely important that governments recognize that the private sector is not the enemy. It is absolutely important that governments realize that profit is not a bad word. Absolutely important. And Hage mentioned the point that you know, Africa has gone through phases, so too has the Caribbean. And the phase that we're now in is to try to determine what is the right role for government. Because lurking in the background of this newly discovered spirit of enthusiasm about industry and commerce and growth is still a large percentage of our population lives in absolute poverty. So in the conversation about the economy and the incorporation and the new partnership with the private sector, must be within that partnership an understanding that we have to do more in dealing with poverty in our countries. And uh, the work that I've seen here with the exemplary um, things that you're doing, Tony, is, is a perfect example of how businesses with good corporate social responsibility supported by governments can have efficient private sector, efficient businesses making profits, but at the same time address the issues of equity and inequality that has traditionally plagued African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries. I believe we are at a juncture in our development where if played correctly, if governments understand their role in facilitating businesses, if governments understand their role of curbing corruption and increasing their legitimacy with their population, 
and private sector people understand that profit is not just for them, but profit is for mankind, then we, as African people, as Caribbean people, as people from the Pacific, can lead in this fourth industrial revolution and truly achieve prosperity for our people. As at the AU, that we divorce Africa from Pacific and Caribbean countries. Now, maybe I fought very hard. So I'm very glad to be here that we are together as ACP countries. <laughs> I would like to say that we, my brother and I, are what I call third wave of African leaders. We used to have first wave of African leaders, extraordinary personalities, those who told us to wake up and fight for our independence. We said Kenyatta, Kwame Krumah, and them. To so our second wave, we were caught up in the Cold War, confusion, and they had one party states and military coups and so on. So I'd like to say we are the third wave of African leaders who deal with the processes, systems, and institutions. We are not uh, thinking of big persons as ourselves, but thinking of processes, systems, and institutions, so that they will prevail when one person is gone. I just wanted to change my presentation. Firstly, we business people and us politicians, we are all doing the same thing. You, your bottom line is profit. Our bottom line is peace, unity, and security. But we are all doing the same thing, and I'm glad that our new governments are investor and business people friendly. That's why we are sitting here. While I talk about good governance in Namibia, while I did everything, we had a shock just recently, where as I was campaigning to be re-elected, and as I had already investigated the ministers, wrote them letters, and after they replied, I gave that to the, to the Anti-Corruption Commission. To my surprise, I saw Al Jazeera having a big event, just timed with my elections. I'm telling you, I got last time 87%. This time I got 56 It's all right still. That's democracy. <laughs> but it's very interesting. So President Buhari was saying, when you fight against corruption, it fights back. But we did take action already. Two ministers are in jail, as I'm talking today. <coughs> Some are going to be arrested. But the thing we have been investigating ourselves. For Al Jazeera took a wiki leak or whatever and circus. But good governance is my forte. And therefore, I think we'll continue to bring Namibia up as a country. I stand uh, this evening before you to share with you the journey of a small country in the Indian Ocean, Seychelles, looking at the next frontier of our development, and that is the blue economy. And I want to share with you concrete steps that we have taken. As you know, Seychelles has a long being a champion of the blue economy, especially at the regional and international level, our advocacy efforts have produced interesting results. Through an innovative debt swap initiative, we secured 15 million US dollars in blue bonds proceeds. 12 million has been allocated to a blue investment fund managed by the Development Bank of Seychelles. The aim of the fund is to support sustainable fishing practices. The remaining three million was allocated to the Blue Grants Fund, managed by Seychelles Climate Change Adaptation Trust, an NGO established in Seychelles to tackle climate change adaptation efforts. In addition, Seychelles secured a grant from the African Development Bank Fund for Africa private sector assistance for the development of our national biotechnology sector.
This grant will support research work, capacity building, business development, and monitoring and evaluation for sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, I have personally introduced and launched a number of initiatives this year to strengthen our policies and improve business environment. This year, I launched a Blue Economy Council at the national level to enhance coordination amongst ministries, department agencies, and other governmental organizations with the aim of strengthening Seychelles ocean governance mechanism. A high-level multi-stakeholder forum was also set up with participation from civil societies and the private sector. Next year, I will launch the Seychelles Blue Economy brand to highlight successful flagship initiatives such as Seychelles Marine Spatial Planning and Blue Bonds. This will be built on national and international legal and policy frameworks. We are also looking into improving trade and commerce with our regional and other trade partners. Seychelles recently signed the AFC FTA and Tripartite FTA, and we are currently in the process of negotiating a deeper and broader entering economic partnership agreement with the European Union. We are building the momentum of our current efforts to promote blue economy, and I take this opportunity to welcome all ACP heads of state to join us in promoting our oceans, rivers, and lakes. I also extend a great welcome to regional investors to invest in our promising sector. The key objective of this evening's dialogue and the presidential panel include developing actionable proposals to promote industrial transformation, including in the blue as well as green economies, and also to agree on strategies for accelerating intra-ACP trade and investment. I believe that we all expect a rich set of proposals to emerge out of these discussions. And in that regard, and ahead of these discussions, let me just mention a few areas that I believe we should give priority. First, the recognition that our people are the most valuable resource that we have. The ACP group of countries has within themselves one billion people, most of whom are under 35 years of age. They are vibrant and increasingly much better educated, given the right skills training and opportunities this large reservoir of young people will become the engine that drives the transformation that we, speak, that we seek as a group and individually also as countries. Towards this end, Kenya has focused itself on achieving universal access to free primary education and we are now in our second year of implementing 100% transition from primary to secondary school. In addition, <laughs> Kenya has also invested heavily in preparing our people for the opportunities afforded by the digital economy through various skills development initiatives, including our digital learning program, which is aimed at integrating the use of digital technologies in the learning of all our public primary schools. The fourth aspect is the need for us to continually improve the regulatory and institutional frameworks, as indeed was mentioned by Tony a little earlier. We need to design effective business laws and regulations that promote the interests of SMEs, SMEs and provide them with an opportunity to innovate and grow into large enterprises. As governments, we need to continuously improve the ease of doing business in order to remove supply-side constraints and increase competitiveness, transparency, and efficiency. By working close to the private sector, we in Kenya have improved our ranking in the World Bank Ease of Doing Business from number 136 in the year 2014 to number 56 
as of last year. The fifth aspect I think we should also focus ourselves on is how to set up frameworks, instruments, and institutions to facilitate innovation and technology transfer as well as absorption. We have a huge opportunity to fundamentally transform into industrialized and job-rich economies through the use of technology. Fundamentally, transform our countries for the better. While most of our countries lack the financial resources to address the current large development deficit, particularly in infrastructure, our young people are tech savvy and indeed have a huge entrepreneurial spirit. And they are ready to embrace a digital revolution. Indeed, our experience in Kenya shows clearly that a flourishing digital and innovation ecosystem can stimulate the growth of ICT-related businesses and technological innovations and nurture vibrant tech startups and incubation hubs, as Tony himself has mentioned with those young men and women that he has supported through his fund and foundation. Further, technology can also promote financial inclusion, promote the growth of e-commerce, and improve the efficiency and transparency of service delivery by governments. By leveraging on digital financial services, access to financial services in Kenya, as a result, has tripled from 26% in 2006 to well over 85% in 2019. About 39% of our private enterprises in Kenya are engaged in e-commerce, and 70% of all e-commerce payments in Kenya are settled through various mobile money payment platforms. I think the second point we need to consider is the need to promote industrialization of agriculture. Stronger linkages between farmers and agro-industry can improve supply chain efficiencies, and improve access to local and global markets, and increase the real incomes of our farmers. In addition, because agriculture employs more than half of our workers, many of them poor, value addition, and the integration of smallholder farmers into national and regional agricultural value chains would contribute to much more inclusive growth and development. The third aspect is that we need to support entrepreneurship and the growth of micro, small and medium enterprises. In Kenya, as I believe in many of the ACP countries, MSMEs contribute about one third of gross domestic output and create about 80% of all employment. MSMEs have the potential to create positive impacts on the welfare of vulnerable groups such as youth, women, and persons living with disabilities. To successfully grow micro, small, and medium enterprises, members of vulnerable and economically disadvantaged groups, we need to ensure that we provide finance, business skills training, and markets, without which most of them, as evidenced, will fall within the first three years. I am sure that all of us look forward to receiving a report on feasible solutions, especially on innovative financing, for accelerating youth, women, and persons living with disability into the entrepreneurship class. Going forward, ladies and gentlemen, we need to diversify our products and identify key service sectors which have a, which have a fast growing trade potential. 
This would include creative and cultural industries, as we were discussing with my sister Mia yesterday, also known as the Orange Economy, which generate today approximately 2.25 trillion US dollars in revenue and 29.5 million jobs globally, according to the first global mapping of this particular sector. So ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I would wish to invite all of you to explore the many investment opportunities that exist in different sectors, not only of Kenya's economy, but of each other's economy. All these ranging from housing, health, manufacturing, agriculture, infrastructure, ICT, fintech, and I'm sure that later you will also hear quite a bit, especially about Kenya's revolutionary money transfer product, which we refer to as M-Pesa, and other fintech products that are available here in Kenya. Kenya will also be very keen to engage with leading captains of industry amongst you with a view of learning the secrets of your own individual successes in your respective countries. ACP countries, I believe, have much to learn from each other, both in terms of our individual successes as well as the common challenges that we all face. Thank you so much. That is Mediterranean.